they were good men. They were, I believe, honest men. I believe they were men uh, that really wanted to begin this journey in leaving the idea of, uh, of Catholicism and going back uh, to the Bible. And in a lot of ways, they accomplished a lot. But I don't believe that they went far enough. And I believe with their understanding and, uh, of, the, of that day, uh, that uh, they just didn't really study enough and comprehend enough. I think their vision was more on trying to refute Catholicism and this all works and all works and uh, selling uh, indul indulgence and doing this and this and this. And they forgot, I believe, to go far enough. Today, we want to look at perseverance of the saints. Or, you may have heard it said this way, once a person gets saved, are they always saved? Or, once in grace, always in grace. Does the Bible teach that? And if the Bible teaches that, then we need to teach that and believe that. But what does the Bible have to say concerning this subject, somebody says, well, why do we even have to have subjects like this? What difference does it really make? Eternity is predicated upon our understanding of this teaching. You need to know what the Bible says about every biblical subject. And that is my obligation, responsibility as a gospel preacher and as a New Testament Christian. The fifth and final tenet of Calvinism is the perseverance of the saints, as referred to oftentimes as once saved, always saved. The impossibility of apostasy or the security of the believer, or once you are in grace, you're always in grace. And so, let's look at what I would refer to as the illogical uh, teaching of Calvinism. They would say the logic of Calvinism. I believe it's illogical. But nevertheless, here it is. Since a man is totally depraved, in other words, a child is born with the sin of their parents, and their parents got it from Adam, and sin just keeps passing down from, and it's hereditary, that they can do nothing on his own but evil. An unconditional election is required to save him. So therefore, here's the logic. If one part of Calvinism falls, then every part of Calvinism falls. Okay? So here is the next step. Then God must call him in an irresistible way to salvation. That in the foreknowledge of God, God knows who's going to save, and because God's going to save a man, uh, then there's nothing that a man can do. He doesn't have free will because God is the one that chose him to be saved. Therefore, he doesn't have to do anything to be saved. He needs to do nothing to remain saved. Anything that he would do in any way would never affect his salvation nor negate, negate the miraculous work of God in saving him. Now, I'm going to, this is a Calvinist preacher, Sam Morris. I believe B.J. Clark actually used this in, in his discussion. All the prayers a man may pray, all the Bibles that we may read, all the churches that he may belong to, all the services that he may attend, all the sermons that he may practice, all the debts that he may pay, all the ordinances he may observe, and all the laws that he may keep, all the benevolent acts he may perform, now watch this, will not make his soul one whit safer. So therefore... He goes on to say, all the sins he may commit from adultery to murder will not make his soul in any more danger. The way a man lives has nothing to do with the salvation of his soul. That's where that doctrine takes you. 
That's where that teaching will lead you. That if you believe that here is the process of Calvinism, that you got the sin of your daddy and mama, so therefore you could baptize a baby, or that, uh, that, that's where that came from. And then uh, once you are saved, you are elected by God, you are predestined by God to be saved or lost. Therefore, once God saves you, there's not one thing you can do to ever jeopardize that. Not one thing. And it doesn't matter how you live. Now, someone's going to probably say, but if you're saved, you'll want to live right. Well, I've had a whole lot of people I've known in my lifetime that said and believed this, and they sure didn't live like they were supposed to live. They didn't live according to Scripture because they believed that they could do anything in their lives. They could have multiple wives. They could have be a homosexual. I asked a guy this one time, could a man be a homosexual once he's saved? He said, well, it might, God might punish him physically, but he, his soul would still be saved. Is that true or is that false? Young people, you, you actually, you need, to, you need to really understand. Everybody needs to understand it, but you really need to know what the Bible says about this. Is this right? If it is, we ought to be teaching it. And what I want to do in the remainder of my lesson today, I want to look at some of the arguments uh, that they make from Scripture, and then I want to refute it with Scripture, and then I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Isn't that fair enough? Isn't that honest enough? So, let's look. They believe in the doctrine of imputation. In other words, in Rome, they would go to Romans chapter 4. And they would say in verse 22, And therefore it is imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, but it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him, raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The doctrine of perseverance of the saints is based upon this false assumption is that the elect sinner is clothed in the personal righteousness of Jesus. You're just like Jesus when you get saved. You're just like Him. The righteousness of Jesus is literally put upon you. And therefore, when God looks at Him, He does not see the sins of the elect. One, rather He sees the perfection of Jesus. And therefore, the doctrine of imputation believes uh, that it doesn't really matter whether you practice righteousness or not. He is elected of God. God saves him. It is uh, uh, the fact that in their minds uh, that that would relieve them of any responsibility whatsoever. Now, someone's going to say, and I, I'm doing this trying to be honest and fair, and somebody might say, well, but if you're really saved, you won't live that way. What did that Calvinist preacher say? Doesn't matter what you do in your life, you will never jeopardize your soul. The impute here, this is the way I'm going to deal with this, that, that to impute is to credit to a person or a cause or to credit by transfer. Now what's this? They believe that the guilt of Adam's sin was imputed to the whole human race. That all sinners, by virtue of the fact that being descendants of Adam, they inherited the guilt of his sin. Wrong. Wrong. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, verse 4, The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. Ezekiel 18, verse 20 says that the sins of the father shall not be passed down to, the, to their father, neither the father to the son. You cannot pass it. You do not become a sinner when you are born. You are in a safe, S-A-L-E, condition. You're not in a lost condition, nor are you in a saved condition because you've never been lost. Now, I want you to notice this. The word impute is found seven times in the New Testament, in the King James Version of the New Testament. And I've got them all listed there. 
not one of these seven passages would teach that the personal righteousness ever becomes the righteousness of another. You show me a scripture that says that my righteousness can be passed down uh, to my son. Nor can you find a passage that says that the righteousness of Jesus, his imperfect or his perfection has been given to me. It doesn't say that. Nowhere does it teach that. As a matter of fact, I can disprove that from Scripture, and we will as we go through uh, the study today. I know some of you are taking notes and you're trying to write real fast. I can't wait on you, so if you'll just write down your email address, or maybe I'll put it, send it out, I'll be glad to give you all of these lessons that uh, I've been working on. The Bible clearly states that one who is considered righteous by heaven is one who practices righteousness. Listen to this uh, argument. Listen to this scripture. 1 John 3 and verse number 7, what the Lord says about righteousness. Verse 7 says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that doeth righteousness. You don't inherit it. You don't pass it down. You don't receive the perfection of Jesus. He says, They that practice righteousness are righteous. Listen to this. I'm going to give you some proof text and... Uh, as we go through this study. I'm trying to be as, I've worked on this lesson for about three weeks. I'm trying to be fair. I'm trying to be honest. I don't want to misrepresent. So, John 10, you've heard this. John 10, 28 and 29. This scripture says in John chapter 10, and I give unto them eternal life. Now, the them are the sheep, the Christians, and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck out of my Father's hand. Now, the argument that no one can snatch them because God saved them, but if you will notice in the text in John 10, 28 and 29, you'll notice a couple of things that's very important to the context of this particular passage. You'll notice in John 10, look at verse number uh, 26. And he says, But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. Those that believe, verse 27, are the sheep that hear my voice, they know me, and they follow me. What did they have to do? They had to hear me, they had to believe me, and they had to follow me. What was the condition? What is it if you keep on hearing, believing, and following, you shall never perish? To that, amen. That's exactly what John 10 teaches. Don't forget and just pull two passages out and say, oh, here you go. The Bible says that no man can ever pluck them out. No, no man can't, but God can. How and why? Because they refuse to believe, verse 26, because they refuse to hear my voice and they refuse to follow me. That's what that passage is teaching. And as long as you walk in the light as he is a light, you have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you, keep on cleansing you from your sin. What's the condition? Right along what he says right here in John 10. Hearing, believing, and following. 1 John 1, 7, if you walk verb in the light, Jesus is the light, you have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus will keep on cleansing you. What's the condition? What's the stipulation? Hearing, believing, and following. Not only that, let's look at 1 John 3, verses 6 uh, through 9. In 1 John 3, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. I've been told. I've been saved, therefore I can't sin if I wanted to sin. Sam Moore said, you couldn't sin if you wanted to sin. If you did sin, it didn't matter. Whosoever sinneth had not seen him, neither knoweth him. Oh, okay. So a man uh, that has sinned 
And a man that keeps on sinning, they would say, never knew him. They don't know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that overcometh sin is the devil, for the devil sinneth from the very beginning. Then in verse number 9, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So the idea here in 1 John 3 is, and I want to go back to that passage, whosoever sinneth, sinneth, that's a verb. And if you look at the original Greek, the text says this in the original, whosoever is about, whosoever keeps on sinning hath not seen him. You're not really a a, a Christian, you're not really wanting to be like Jesus. You're not really wanting uh, to be faithful to God if you just keep on sinning. Now, I want you to notice a word that is overlooked. For his seed remaineth in him. His seed? What's Luke 8 verse 11 say? The seed is the word of God. Being born again, 1 Peter 1, being born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible, which is the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. If the Word of God remaineth in you, if you're living by the Word of God, you're not going to practice habitual sin. You're not going to live like the world. Why? Because you're a Christian and the seed is in you. What is the seed? The seed is the Word of God. Luke 8, 11, 1 Peter 1, verse 23, and verse 25. And the word of the Lord endureth forever. So, what do you have in this passage? What you have when you get to this passage, you have John saying, he's already said this, you must walk in the light as he is in light to have fellowship. Okay? So this can't contradict what he said. So what he says in 1 John 3 is abiding in the Word, abiding in Christ, growing in Christ. Commit a, if you just keep on committing sin, if you just keep on practicing sin, then you don't have the seed in you. If you, as long as you keep the seed, the Word of God in you, you let the Word of God rule you, dominate you, control you, restrain you, then you're not going to practice sin in your life. That's what 1 John 3, verses 6 through 9 teaches. Not only that, if once saved, always saved is true. I had a preacher tell me not too long ago, he said, if you're really, really saved, and God, and you're the elect, and God predestined you, he said, you, I, he said, you can be married and divorced as many times as you want to, he said, you can go to the bar. You can do whatever you, you want to do. I said, no wonder there's so much ungodliness and immorality among religious folks. Friends, if once saved, always saved is true, then every conditional statement regarding and relating to salvation in the Bible needs to be removed. Let me just give you a few of them. If you're saved once and you're always saved, then what does Revelation 2 verse 10 mean? What's the stipulation of that verse? Some of you shall be cast into prison for 10 days. But if you will remain faithful unto death, you will receive a crown of life. Now, let's dissect just what I have up there. Number one, be faithful unto death. What if you're not? What's the consequences? Somebody says, well, it might affect you physically. That's not what that says. This here says you won't even get a crown of life. I'll give you a crown of life if you will remain faithful unto death. And this was talking to people that literally were being persecuted uh, by Domitian, the Roman emperor. He was taking Christians, putting them in, into hot boiling water. He was beheading them. And he said, listen, you've got to remain faithful even if you have to die for your faith to get the crown of life. How you get around that verse, you don't if you understand the context. Matthew 10, 22, and uh, 
Matthew 24, 30, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. What if he don't endure to the end? Well, God's still going to save. That's not what that verse says, friends. Somebody says, yeah, but... Now listen, there's, there's a lot of people that, 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 that believes that once you're saved, you're always... Oh, I understand that. I have a lot of family members that have believed that. I, I, I've got cousins that believe that. The majority of the people is never the standard for what's right and what's wrong when it comes to the Word of God. I'm not asking what the majority believe. The majority of the people in the world today is going to hell. Did you know that? That's what Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14 says. Entering in straight gate, for wide is the gate, raw is the way that leads to destruction, and many will go in thereat. I'm not going to follow the majority. Our standard is Scripture and what Jesus said, He that endures to the end, to the end of my life. To the end of my service here on this earth. If I do that, I'll be saved. What if I don't? God's still going to save me? What is the admonition? Not only that, James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he is, is approved, or when he is recognized by God, one uh, translation says, or commentary says, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love Him. What if you love Him? John 14, 15, you're going to keep my commandment. Look at James 1, 12. The man who endures temptation, overcomes temptation, he will receive the crown. What if you don't overcome temptation? Still going to get the crown? Too many verses, brethren. Too many verses. I'll give you another one. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Therefore, to him that thinketh he stand, take heed, lest he fall. Who's he writing to? He's writing to those Christians. What was the situation in Corinth? A lot of immorality, ungodliness. What was the situation? Some of the Corinthians had gone back. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 5, there was one that had his father's wife and uh, was practicing fornication, and not one thing was being done about it. And he talked about, Paul did, as he's writing to the church there, he said, you better remove that one, lest a little leaven leaven the whole lump. What difference does that make? If everybody in the Corinth is going to be saved anyway. Therefore, to him that thinketh he stand, you better take heed, lest you fall, fall from what? You can't fall from a state or a position that you have never obtained. Not only that, Galatians 5 and verse 4. Paul said to the Galatians, some of them were trying to go back under the law of Moses for justification. And Paul said in Galatians 5, 4, write it down, look at it. You are fallen from grace. Well, you can't fall from grace. Paul by inspiration, said they had fallen from grace. In Hebrews chapter 6, Easton read for us, verses 4 through 6, they had tasted of the heavenly gift. They had uh, gone through all of these things. As a matter of fact, I put in my notes here. They were once enlightened. They tasted of the heavenly gift. They were uh, regenerated, they were uh, Christians, they became children of God, uh, they were partakers of the Holy Spirit, that meant they were in fellowship with God's people, they were children of God, but look at what he said, it's impossible to renew them again into repentance. Why? Because God wouldn't forgive them? No, because their hearts had become so hardened, they wouldn't change, they wouldn't go back and do what God wanted them to do. They had been Christians. The text says they were enlightened. John 8, 12, Jesus is the light. Walk in the light. Anytime you see the word light in the New Testament, it always denotes that which is holy and right and good. We're to be the light of the world. What are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be people that practice righteousness. Not only that, as we bring this lesson to a conclusion, I want you to look at some of these passages. Galatians, writing to the churches of Galatia. He says, Brethren, if anyone be overtaken in a fall, then you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest also thy be tempted. 
restore such a one. You know what that concept is, that restoring? You bring them back where they once was. The spiritual state that they had been in. They had been overtaken in sin. They had been overcome by sin. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to restore them. Why? Because they had fallen. We want them to come back to where they once were. That's what we're about here at Will Ed oftentimes. We want people uh, to be where they once were. Now, why? Galatians 6 verse 1 and Jude 1 verse 23. But others save with, here, with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even hating the garment defiled by the flesh. Friends, the list goes on and on and on. You know what we have just done? We have looked briefly at the concept that came out of a doctrine in the 1500s and the 1600s of once saved, always saved. It was developed by John Calvin and Martin Luther. It didn't come from the Bible. Somebody says, really? That's exactly what happened. What happened because Catholicism had, you had to pay money, you had to buy indulgence, you had, uh, you had to do this, this, and then you, it was like you're working, you're paying your way, you could even uh, do this for somebody else's sins, and you, it's all works, it's all works, works. Calvin said, it's not about works, it's about faith. And so he goes to the other end of the spectrum and he says, it's not like that. This is the way it is. It's all faith. It's all Jesus. It's all the sovereignty of God. And there's not one thing man can do to save himself. It's all God. God elects who he wants to save. Even before he creates us, he knows who we're saved or lost. And God's responsible for it. You don't have a free uh, choice in the matter. And yet the Bible says over and over and over. Behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. Revelation 22, 19 and 20. I stand at the door, and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open that door, I will come unto him, and I will sup with him. That doesn't make any sense. If Calvin was right, that doesn't make any sense at all. Why does the Bible say you take the gospel and you go into all the world and you preach the gospel and he that believes that gospel and is baptized obeys the gospel, becomes a Christian, and he is added to the body of Christ and the admonition all the way through the New Testament is to live for the Lord. Be, be like Jesus in your life. Be that light. Be that salt. See, we've gone too far. In the 1500s, they went way too far to the left. Over here was Catholicism. It's all about works, 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 works. And let me tell you, you've got to come back to the middle. The Bible does. And what the Bible says is that faith, faith and obedience saves a man. Then I say, well, you find me a passage that says that. John 8, 24, unless you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins. Let me show you another passage. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in His mighty angels, with His mighty angels, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I've had people tell me, I, I preached on the radio one time, and a fellow said, boy, I agree with just about everything you say. I don't know where you get that phrase at, obeying the gospel. Here's where I get it. Here's where I get it. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and he being made perfect became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Let me tell you where I get it. Have they not, they have not all obeyed the gospel? How shall they hear unless they be sent? And how shall they be sent? Well, we're going to have to send them. What are they going to do? They're going to preach. What are they going to preach? They're going to preach the gospel. What do we have to do in Romans 10? Oh, verse 17 said, Then faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing the word of God. What did they do? They heard. That's God's part, is to save us. We're not taking anything away from God. God's sovereignty, God's power, God's love, God's mercy saves us. It's available for us. 
But the terms and the pardon of salvation is man's part that we've got to do. So what do we do? We take these two extremes and we go back to the Bible and we say, according to Scripture, that when a man, if a man's going to become a Christian, if anyone's going to become a Christian, they're going to hear the gospel, they're going to believe it, they're going to obey the gospel, they're going to repent of their sins, they're going to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and they're going to be baptized not for the water to wash away our sins, but for the blood of Jesus to wash away our sins when we obey what God said to do. That's what we're going to do. Why? Because that's what Scripture teaches. And then what we're going to do, we're going to walk in the light. We're going to take heed lest we fall. We're going to be careful that we don't do like those Galatians and have fallen from grace. We're going to be careful that we do what John said in Revelation 2.10. And we do not want to become unfaithful. We want to be faithful. Why? we got a crown of life waiting for us. You see how all of this works? The problem of it is, the religious world says, well, it was good enough for grandparents. It's good enough for Martin Luther, and it's good enough for Calvin, and they were smart men, intelligent men. Good enough for those guys. It's got to be good enough for me. On the day of judgment, my friends, you would have wished, you would have taken the time and the consideration of your own soul and look at what the Bible said. Because you're going to be judged according to the Word of God. And it's so serious. And I've tried to everything I've said today. I know sometimes that we can be ugly, but I don't want to be ugly. I don't want to be mean-spirited. I want people to know the will of God and the truth that they can go to heaven. And someone says, yeah, but that's just what you've always... No, 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 I've not always believed this. You know, there's a lot of things that I haven't always believed. I, I, and I'm still learning, and I'm still growing, and I'm still studying, and I'm still maturing. I, I haven't arrived yet. But I love the Lord enough to keep on trying. Do you? Someone says, ah, uh, to me one time, in front of a lot of people, he was an older man. He said, I wouldn't take what I've got right here for a stack of Bibles that go in a, a, a mile in the sky, he said, and he was so proud of saying that, making that statement. Friends, I know I'm saved. I know I'm a Christian. But that's not based upon my feelings. I know I'm a Christian because what this Word says. Does it have to be heartfelt? You better believe. You better have it in your heart. You better be sincere about it. There's no doubt about that. But I'm not going to heaven just because I think or I feel I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven because God has revealed His Word to me. In this area, unlike any area I've ever preached in, unlike any area, that, and I've preached in Atlanta and South Georgia, and I have preached in Monterey and in Jackson County and other places, Nowhere else have I ever heard at the magnitude of people that just don't take the Bible and open it up. Somebody says, well, you put too much emphasis on Scripture. Somebody says, you, you're forgetting how important it is for you in your mind, in your heart. You've got to let God come in your heart and save you. I agree with that 100%. God comes into our hearts and saves us when we do what? He tells us to do then and only then. Think about it today. Perhaps I said something today that you just kind of turned me off and you say, well, that's one of those Church of Christ sermons. I don't have any Church of Christ sermons. I have Bible sermons. And Bible sermons is the only thing that's going to save us. This is not something that our our church fathers or our church leaders and, and our brotherhoods got together and said, okay, this is going to be the rules and the bylaws and the creeds for this local current. We don't have that because the Bible doesn't have that. What we do have is people that love God, open up the Bible, and want to do what the Bible says. And perhaps I don't understand all this. Maybe you can help me. Do you love me enough to try do you really want to help me see this if I've missed it? Don't come to me and say, well, I, I, I know how I feel. 
I had a man come to my office when I was in, way in the old building over there, and he spent about 45 minutes, and all he talked about was his experience and how he was on a stump. And he said, boy, I left that day. He said, I was just overwhelmed with the Spirit of God. I just felt like I'd never felt in my life. And he started crying and was pretty worked up in the office. And I let him talk. Only one problem with that, sir. You show me in the Scriptures where the Bible says to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and you take it out of its context and make it apply to where God doesn't make that apply. If you call upon the name of the Lord, the way you call upon the name of the Lord is to do His will. When people come to talk to me, I don't tell them what I did September 1977 when I obeyed the gospel. I tell them what every person in the New Testament had to do to become a Christian. There's a pattern. A pattern. Thanks be to God for that pattern that we have obeyed, for that form of doctrine that we obey. If you're not a Christian today, would you think about becoming one? Would you love God enough to say, I've been putting this thing on too long. I'm going to quit worrying about what the world thinks and what everybody else thinks, and I'm just going to do what the Bible says, and I want to become a Christian today. We ask you to believe in Jesus Christ because that's what the Lord said. We ask you to repent, Luke 13, 3, and again in verse 5. We ask you to confess with your mouth, Romans 10, 10, and to be baptized, Mark 16, 16. The light figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. It's not the water that saves you, it's the blood of Jesus when we obey what God said to do to become a Christian. If you need to come back home, we'll pray with you. And in all of this, the admonition from Scripture is that we be faithful until we die. Would you come right now while together we stand, we sing.